Mum, I've got people in the office now, so I'll give you a call back later, yeah? All right, love you. Bye. Bye. Every day. Let's see how little sun's doing. Off the fucking look of all cunts, basically. North Peckham is one of the most notorious estates in London. One in three men who live here are unemployed. Nine out of ten are without work. Crime flourishes amid the decay. This is the no-go estate where postmen, rent collectors and even doctors refuse to tread without a police escort. Growing up in Peckham uh, wasn't great for me as I was probably the poorest kid on the estate. You know, patches on patches on patches, everything was second hand. I don't think I ever had anything new until I went out to work when I was 12. Got my first pound a day job, then I could start saving for that. And that, in my brain it was always the way you know what, I'm never bringing my kids up like this, I'm never going to do this. I mean, parents done what they could do. I think we moved in on a skip lorry, it was that bad, you know. It was, you know when there was poor people, I was the poorest. My dad was a labourer, uh, my mum just got any job she could, like she was uh, cleaning, working in the cinema, we used to get free tickets to go, cinema, that was one good thing. Uh, but, you know, we never had... The money was never there, you know, we never, lying on the floors, no carpet, and I swore, I even remember it going, right, the first thing I'm going to do if I get a job, carpet my own room, I'm going to carpet my own room, you know, and I did, at 15 I think, I went, I remember getting a grey carpet, she still talks about it now, put grey carpet in my room, because it was like such a luxury, but yeah, we still had a coal fire, Every we was like 10 years behind a black and white TV when everybody else had colour, and that was one of the things, we used to watch the TV thinking, I swear to God, when I get older, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure I've got the biggest TV. I'm gonna, make... and I remember it in in uh, Pincock Place, even when I couldn't afford it when I, when I was just a builder, but still, I'd, I'd, the great big projection screen things, right? You remember they were about that wide and this big. I went, right, I'm gonna get a 47 inch, saved up the money. We couldn't get up the stairs because <laughs> it's better to take it back and get a 42 inch. But you know, so at least my daughter, you know, when she was growing up, she had a big TV screen to watch because. I just couldn't handle all this black and white, small, and I was always coming up with ideas of when I'm old, I'm going to have this coming out, I'm going to have a swimming pool, I'm going to have this, all these, in my brain, I just didn't want to be what I was, you know, what I was brought up with, you know, because it's hard, Peckham, and, you know, kids like taking the piss, like, you haven't got Farrah's with a big thing then, you haven't got Farrah's, so I'd be trying to get second-hand labels and stick them on, it was a poor family, you know, there's no getting away from it, it was a poor family. Schools I went to, Camelot, when I was a, uh, a junior, and then Scott Lidget, scumbag school when I was a, uh, but it was better than Peckham boys, but it, 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 was the same, it was the same thing. I was great, I was really uh, hands on, right a school little nerd, no one knew my name. I used to think, how comes all these other geezers? Why Johnson? All the teachers would know their name. So as soon as I, I just had a turn around in my, in, my, in my career of where I went, you know what, I'm sick of just being the little goody-goody who's done all the work, who's done it. So the next minute I become a bit of a bad kid. It, I'll die now! I'll die now! That's all you could hear around the school. Da, da, da. I left school just to work, you know. I, I just I quit school. I never got an exam, never got a, a certificate, never got nothing. I went out, I thought, I need money now. I, I can't wait. To, so 14... I was doing uh, side jobs, working in a timber yard, uh, you know, just learning all about the buildings. I thought, well, I've got to be a builder, got to get a trade, got to do something. And then got my apprenticeship at 16 uh, to be a to be a carpenter. So uh, it all worked, it all panned out in the end. It could have went a bit wonky, but you know, it, it, I wasn't doing bad stuff. But I was just grafting. You know, I just the school weren't working for me, so I, I just grafted and just done it all that way. 
you, you find the right pass and the wrong part, you know, one phone call, you remember, can, you know, I've, I've tried to teach kids, so I was doing martial arts when he was in deprived areas, saying one phone call can change your life. You know, one black fan, but now just do this little thing for me. Just all you gotta do is just pick up this package. You know, that can change up someone, a kid's whole life. If they can say, no, I ain't doing no, sorry, no, I don't want the five grand, no, I don't want the five hundred quid. If they can just say no, they can be, and I was always a strong personality, I always from a kid, I was always like my own thing going, I ain't doing this. I'd stop going football and stick some way from inside and doing all sorts because of football. You know, football was bad in the 80s, it was it was really the hooliganism. I see it, it was mental, uh, Neil Wall, you know, and, but you either run with it or didn't, and it was a lot of peer pressure in it, so it was a lot of like, come what's wrong with you, you know, you got to do it, but I, I just steered away from it, I was always into dancing, so I was night clubbing, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whenever I could, I was out clubbing, doing whatever, and I remember this geezer, he just pulled me aside and he went, yeah, can you fight? I mean, why? He went, there's all them geezers over there, because you're a good dancer, they ain't going to kick you already. He gave me a card, he went, hey, you've got to get out of this club and I'm fine. And I'd done judo before, I was a gold medalist judo, I'd done all that. Me and my uh, Del Sweeney is still a pal today, you know, one of my longest lasting friends who still works at Droxing uh, with my security. Uh, me and him went down to this Jakob style self defence. It should have been called the uh, Smash Your Head In style of self defence because we got battered for years there, you know, you was in a house, you'd work your way up. A bit like Game of Death, you'd work right to the floors, you know, you hear the screams from the other room, you weren't allowed there, it was all like, don't look at the black belt, don't look at this, but when you went in that room, until you got from that room to the next room, all you could hear was screams and thinking, oh my god, I don't even want to go to the next room. Many good bonds were made in, in, in the Jakob stuff, and it was so far ahead of its time, so far ahead at the time, you know, because you'd go, oh, we're on the ground and we're punching this, and they go, that's not martial arts. Grab me. Grab, oh, just have a squeeze up, Doc. Come on, then. Like a man, like a man, <laughs> Doc, yeah? What can I say to Conditioning is the main You've thing. got a lot of muscle around that. Window. No, it's yeah. poor conditioning. Yeah. But also, it's there is so condition. much bravado with this, in terms of, yes, of course you're in very good shape. Look, you're at, look at the guy. Have a look at the guys. No, 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 they're in very good shape. Look at, but the difference is, if you, if you sustain repeated head injury, head trauma, you can get serious brain injury. I think me and Andy was... I, cu I couldn't even put my finger on it, but obviously we was thinking of names, yeah, you always think of the ultimate this, the badass competition, Cage Rage coming back somewhere, uh, at the time, oh it's too violent, you know, a lot of TV channels, oh Cage Rage, oh it's too violent, oh this is, and then all of a sudden Sky love it, oh we love this, you know, it just all depends, you know, sometimes a name is too violent for the time, or it doesn't actually say what it is, Cage Rage really kind of said what it was, although, Maybe that did block us from a, a few channels. Maybe it didn't. Who knows? But it's a name now. People still go, are we going Cage Rage this weekend? They still call it Cage Rage, you know? So it's one of the names that is stuck in everybody's brain and it ain't never going away. Live on Sky Sports across the UK and Europe, bringing you Cage Rage 21 Judgment Day. I can't hear them. Woo! Right. This is the capital, capital of MMA, Andy, Absolutely. London. We have got the biggest mixed martial arts event ever staged in the UK, right here at the fabulous Wembley Arena, right here for you this evening. Oh my God. <laughs> we are live on Sky Sports, we are live across the world. We are in the USA, Canada, we're in Malaysia, Korea, Brazil, Japan, Japan you everywhere. name it. This show is being beamed around the world, officially the largest, most watched event the UK has ever held with the most exciting fights, I think you'll agree. But next up, the main event of the evening. David Tank Abbott versus Gary Smaila. Uh, the first MMA event, Obviously, it was Cage Rage number one. Uh, I was training with Andy, like Andy Gear was training with me at the time, and he was watching. I was taking my guys around. And I just, it's funny enough, you should be there, because I was looking, as you were saying, look. And they were saying, what you got to do is get your guys involved in uh, in loads of competitions. You keep looking, we're in competitions, Cage War, winning all these different uh, medals and. and Whatever it was, and I was writing articles for all the magazines, and there's all the trophies, all the, all the guys doing all the trophy work. And we, but every competition we was going to, they were cheating, the refs weren't right, the judges weren't right, they weren't looking after fighters right. 
So, uh, it being a bit of money, mate, he said, what would it take to put on a, what, come on, what, what could we do to put our own competition on? You know, let's be the first in, in London to put a nice big show on. So he worked it out. I mean, you know what, let's do it. And 2002, we'd done our own uh, cage, uh, cage raise number one. And yeah, as he said the other day on Facebook, it changed our life. It was one of them because we said, no, the stress was too much. Yes, it was a nightmare. But, you know, it, at the end of the night, it was like, wow, we've done it. And then, of course, number two come along in the York Hall, number three, Caesars. It just rolled on, rolled on. I'm Dave O'Donnell, this is Andrew Gear, and we're going to tell you what cage rage is all about. Yeah. Andy, what is MMA and cage well, fighting? MMA, cage fighting, ultimate fighting, whatever you want to call it, it is the biggest combat sport in the world right now and has been for many years. Two normal guys, big ideas, uh, you know, we've been in business, we've been in entertainment, and I think that's what it is, business and entertainment together, that's what made cage rage so good. You know, it wasn't just about putting on fights, it was about Glitter, girls, music, sound, lights, you know, that's what sent Cage Rage in. And we had great ideas, it was not about, even now, I said, God, we're gonna get this guy over from Brazil. They, they weren't getting names, you know, people wanna see names, legends, they may not be at the top of their tree, but if you if you say Tank Abbott, everybody put their hand up, yeah, I know Tank. If you say Ken Shamrock, if you, if you say Vita Belfort, Anderson Silva, everybody knew them guys. So we just worked endlessly to get big names over. So instead of just going like that, it just rode really, really fast. We had good backers at the time. And it's all about money, you know, don't get me wrong, it was all about money. Uh, but it was all about ideas. We were fresh with ideas all the time, kept it rolling, kept production going. Uh, and me and Andy did spend a lot, a lot of time together working this, working fights, working the next big thing, how we'll get everybody excited. You know, and that's what we did, we, we just made excitement. And uh, going back to a lot of the other promotions at the time, everybody hated us, oh, they're putting on freak shows, Butterbee, this. But you mentioned Butterbee, everybody knew him. So you may have 14 great fights on the card, and then you may have one name fighter, it wasn't gonna be a great fight, yet sometimes it turned out to be a great fight. But the crowd appreciated that. And it was all about, it wasn't about the few MMA fans at the time, what it was, it was about getting to mainstream at the time. And of course that's what uh, got Sky Sports involved, they loved it, you know, and it, it was, they could see a big rise in, in guys loving MMA, you know, because at the time it was like two guys running around on the floor, I don't want to see that. But we made fights were exciting, we had the underdog. We didn't have well matched fights, we had an underdog and we had a, a guy from America. And sometimes our underdog would win and that would shoot them to the next level, you know. You look at Buzz Berry and Ken Shamrock, no one would give Buzz a chance. Knocked him out, bash, you know, Buzz Berry became a superstar. Same thing with uh, Neil Grove knocking out uh, James Thompson. You know, all, all these guys were underdogs, but it was giving them, you know, I didn't say, it's an even fight. I said, look, you've got a one in 10 chance here, you've got a two in 10 chance here, but this could make you. And that's what made Cage Rose great. It was UFC and Pride together, which kind of give us the idea of like, you know, let's make it a big show, not just fights. And that's what, that's what sets, that's what sets the next level. And that's what got, I think Elite XC involved, you know, they, they were looking thinking, hang on, this is the number two promotion. And of course the big deal come through, offered so much money, you know, it's about, about $10 million. It's a hard number to say, no, nah, we're all right, we're gonna crack on. You know, we had, to, we had to go with it. But within a year, they killed our brand, they killed me and Andy here, they killed the whole show, you know, they went bankrupt, left us with absolutely nothing, penniless, you know, scraping the streets going, what do we do? And that's a hard, you know, to have to be that close to being a multimillionaire to coming down to nothing. I just bought the house, we had, you know, it was in ruins, we were trying to, we were, we were trying to get money together. Hard times, but it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get back up. And you know, I, I just went within space for a couple of months, I was up and running. A lot of the other guys, like Andy, he rebuilt his, uh, 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 tool hire company, rebuilt his building companies. You know, he started again and went, right, I'm doing that. I'm out of MMA, which I don't blame him for. Uh, I just stuck with it because I just thought, I'm sick of building. I've been building since I was 12 years old. I had no more building in, in my head left. I, I just loved MMA. I've always been involved in MMA. So I just, I just carried on and it just seemed to work. You know, it was sm much smaller, but it just seemed to work. So, and that's where you said MMA was born.